thankfully, with some of our industry partners here in, in the States, I was able to bring down enough implants for all those ACL reconstructions we were going to do. So the equipment down there, the implants down there, it's all donated, which is a wonderful situation. And it gives everybody and industry and physicians and other industry partners the ability to pay it forward. And, and the reality is, is that we can help so many people with equipment that we might think to be secondary here in this country, but it's so important down there. Clock in, scrub up, and join us behind the red line. You're listening to First Case, a perioperative podcast bringing you exciting interviews, engaging discussions, and innovative solutions that are changing the way patients receive surgical care. Each episode, we talk to frontline staff, perioperative leadership, and nursing entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the back table to the boardroom, from wheels in to wheels out, we tackle the real-life issues affecting the OR. Whether you're tuning in for surgical service education or inspiration, we're glad you're here. And now it's time to roll back and start the first case. This week on First Case, we're going to be talking with Dr. Michael Redler, orthopedic surgeon with One World Surgery, and we're going to be talking all about surgical medical missions and the different ways that we can give back to our community. When I spoke with Dr. Redler prior to this conversation, he told me all about the the, the reach that One World Surgery had within Honduras and then coming up. They're also going to be in the Dominican Republic. And Paul, I was really just amazed at all of the good that they are doing in Honduras and and the ways that they are changing patients' lives. It was really great to just hear what they were doing, and I wanted this to be something that we could share with our audience. You know, I think our audience will be really interested to hear about how they can become involved and also what a wonderful organization this is and what impact that going down and doing a medical mission can have on the people of these underserved countries. So I, I think we're going to have a great conversation, and I'm really looking forward to talking to Dr. Redler. All right. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Dr. Michael Redler. Oh, and by the way, Melanie, I think you're doing a great job taking over for Justin this week. Maybe we should make that permanent. Hi, I'm Paul Wafer. I'm Melanie Perry. And I'm Justin Poulin. A 17 Studios production, you're listening to First Case. Joining us now is Dr. Michael Redler. Dr. Redler is a sports medicine and hand and upper extremity surgeon in Connecticut. He is an assistant clinical professor at the Frank H. Netter School of Medicine at Quinnipiac University. He is visiting assistant clinical professor of orthopedics at the University of Virginia, and he is on the physician leadership board of One World Surgery and has been to Honduras for medical missions and surgery several times, which brings us to the topic of our show, Surgical Missions. Dr. Redler, thank you for joining us. Melody, thanks for having me. This is going to be such an exciting interview. I love the idea of giving back and I love the idea of serving people who cannot help themselves and all of the ways that we have been blessed and we have, we can give back to others. And so I really am looking forward to talking about your involvement with surgical missions and the ways that you are changing lives of people in other parts of the world. But why don't you go ahead and give everybody else that's listening more of your background and just tell us about yourself. Well, Melanie, I've been in practice for a long time at Connecticut. And as you suggested, I do specialize in sports medicine and upper extremity surgery. One of the things I think that I take the greatest pride in currently is my involvement with One World Surgery. One World Surgery sponsors brigades and medical missions to Honduras and soon to be the Dominican Republic to really sort of help those who really can't help themselves. And one of the things that we do down there is we take care of the poor people around the country. We are able to provide surgical care medical care, and a lot of things that they couldn't get otherwise. And 
it is something that has touched my heart and something that has been very special to me. And I've had the opportunity to be down there in Honduras now seven times. Wow, that's amazing. I am somewhat jealous. I want to get in on this trip or get on on the next one, maybe, and get involved. It's something that I would really love to do. But to think about how surgery is different in the United States or in maybe just first world countries in general compared to what it's like in Honduras or your experience in other countries, can you talk about the differences, like maybe what they have or what we have that they don't or things that we might take for granted here in the United States? So listen, the people of Honduras are wonderful people. They're hardworking. They want to support their families. They want to be able to educate their children. They want to be able to get ahead. Unfortunately, the medical system as it stands now is, is rather poor. And in fact, if a Honduran patient goes into one of the state hospitals and say they break their hip and they need hip surgery, one of the first things will say, okay, well, you have to pay for these implants before we'll actually do the surgery. So the opportunities for them to get great care and great outcome are very limited. That brings in one world surgery and we are able to do different types of surgeries for these patients. You know, my specialty is is orthopedic sports medicine upper extremity, but they are also at One World Surgery doing gynecological surgery, general surgery, ophthalmology. They have dental clinics so that the full gamut is able to be supplied for these patients. You know, the bottom line is, is that these are patients that just want to be able to support their families and get better. And what we're able to do is to provide that opportunity for them. Certainly, it's not the same state of the art of surgeries and equipment that we have in this country. But the bottom line is we're able through donations and through sometimes used equipment to, to make it work. So it's, it's a different set of circumstances, but we're able to provide excellent surgical care. Dr. Redler, is your organization, do they have a, a ongoing clinic that's always there and with people rotating in and out? Or do you practice at a specific location within the country while you're there? So uh, there is uh, a specific location. It's in the central portion of Honduras. It's up in the mountains. It's called the El Central. It is called Holy Family Surgical Center. And, and, and Paul, it's, it's a very interesting situation because it was founded by an orthopedic surgeon, his wife from Minneapolis, Peter and Lulu Daly, who went down there to try and do some good, saw that this wasn't possible, were able to build up from a small trailer to now a surgical center and a clinic. The clinic there has a staff, it's got nurses, it's got aides, and it has a medical director as well as general medical doctors. The interesting thing about this center is it sits on the grounds of a 2,000 acre ranch that houses 250 to 300 children, children's home. And I say children's home because these children don't get adopted. They grow up on the ranch there. They have been rescued off the street. They've been rescued from violence and they're all around us as well, which brings me to my point. There is an absolutely fabulous man down there who's an orthopedic surgeon. His name is Dr. Merlin Antunes, and he runs the clinic while we're not there. And Merlin grew up on the children's home. Wow, that's amazing. So is Merlin then the one who triages the patients and determines what needs they have and organize with the uh, rest of the organization for, for example, when an orthopedic surgeon is going to come down that, that can address a specific problem? And does he do the follow-up as well? So One World Surgery sponsors brigades, and there may be now at this point 25 or 30 brigades a year. And again, it's been less, unfortunately, with the pandemic. But 
what happens is volunteers come down, they'll screen patients, they'll operate in some patients, and they'll set up patients that, hey, you need an ACL reconstruction, and they'll then schedule it for a future brigade. But in terms of follow-up care and the day-to-day care and some of the surgeries are not there, Merlin and his Honduran staff will take care of that. But he does so with our full support. And matter of fact, I was on WhatsApp with him just earlier this week consulting about him, about a patient that was down there. That's terrific. I love that there's still continuity of care, even when one surgeon is in Connecticut and the other surgeon is in Honduras. The beauty of technology and the the world that we live in today, you can still make sure that those patients are cared for and you can make sure that they're getting the best care no matter what country that they're in. When you are going on mission trips down there and you're getting ready to do surgery or to do several surgeries, can you just talk about the the process for you for that week while you're down there, kind of what your schedule's like or what supplies from here you have to take with you or what maybe be provided when you get there in, in Honduras? Yeah, that's a great question, Melody, because obviously the, the first thing that they're happy to have is our labor and our effort and our skill. But one of the things that we want to do is frankly, is to try and make it equipment neutral if you can. And and what I mean by that, on the last trip that I was down there, which is actually just in October, I did 16 surgeries that week, including 10 ACL reconstructions. And thankfully, with some of our industry partners here in, in the States, I was able to bring down enough implants for all those ACL reconstructions we were going to do. So the equipment down there, the implants down there, it's all donated, which is a wonderful situation. And it gives everybody and industry and physicians and other industry partners the ability to pay it forward. And, And the reality is, is that we can help so many people with equipment that we might think to be secondary here in this country, but it's so important down there. So with the vendors, I can understand like maybe getting implants and things like that, but what about the capital equipment needs? Things like if you're doing arthroscopic ACLs, do you have decent light sources and arthroscopes and those kinds of things? And and then who maintains that equipment for you while you're down there doing those cases? Well, that's a great question. And, and so listen, What we have down there is not state of the art, but if I showed you pictures, Paul, of surgery, you might from the outside say, gee, this looks like it could be uh, an OR in the U.S. Are the lights as good as they are up here? No. Is the arthroscopy equipment as good? No. Is sometimes the picture oval instead of round? Yes. Is it sometimes a little (laughs) bit of green color? (laughs) Yes. But can we see what we're doing? Yes. And, And so this equipment has been donated. There are some techs that will come and try and service the equipment. But frankly, we're always looking for better equipment and and equipment that in the U.S. may say, hey, this has outlived its livelihood and then a U.S. OR becomes premium equipment down there. So we're able to do some reasonably sophisticated surgeries down there because of the generosity of so many people in this country. So you mentioned earlier when you were talking about how this changes the lives of the patients in Honduras. They're waiting for surgery and they can't have surgery in the other hospitals because they have to pay for their implants up front or other barriers to surgery that may exist. So for the patients that you're seeing, how are they pre-selected or who determines who will be able to receive an operation? So that's a great question. So no patient at Holy Family Surgical Center or in conjunction with One World Surgery is asked to pay anything for their surgery. Some will make a donation if they're able to financially do so. Some may bring you a chicken. Some may bring you some beans. But the point is, is that they are all seen in the clinic because there is a clinic there. Brigades will go down. They will see the patients. They will make the diagnosis and they may set them up for a future brigade to have surgery. The staff at Holy Family Surgical Center will determine how urgent the surgery is. They will determine the financial capabilities of the, of the patient. But again, none are asked to pay for surgery. And then they are ramped up. So when I went down in October, and this, by the way, was my seventh trip, 
I was told, yeah, you've got 10 ACLs to do and six other surgeries to do. And you go down, you review the charts, and most importantly, then you meet the patients. And why do I say most importantly? Well, MRIs are very scarce in Honduras. And so you need to make darn certain that once you've met this patient and heard their history and examined this patient, that they truly do have an unstable knee and need an ACL reconstruction. The truth of the matter, however, is these patients sometimes are waiting years for surgery. When I was down this past October, the shortest amount of time that someone was waiting for surgery was over two years. The longest a patient was waiting for surgery, and this was an ACL reconstruction, they had an unstable knee, was eight years. Wow. And as such, they will come, they will do what they need to do to get there, but this is not like they're being scheduled for surgery and having it done next month. So then with all of the wait times that they're already experiencing, throw in the pandemic and suddenly that only had to be exacerbated. Is that correct? Did it just make things take longer? Oh my gosh, yes. And and I was fortunate enough to be down there previously in February of 2020 with my daughter, who is a pediatric intensive care nurse. And we did over 20 surgeries that week and felt wonderful. We came back to the U.S. February 29th. And of course, we know what happened within a few weeks. So all those people that had already been waiting so long for surgery were now waiting a couple years longer. And, you know, they did the best they could in terms of supporting these patients while there were no brigades down there. But certainly no one was getting better or able to move forward. So along with the surgeon doing the case, of course, anesthesia is another important part of the team and and also the nurses and scrub techs that are going to be assisting you. Do you bring that whole team down with you when you go? Do they have what they need as well? So in any given brigade, you do have the opportunity to bring your team members down with you. And that can be scrub techs. It can be pre-op, post-operative nurses. It can be circulating nurses. But there is a wonderful thing that happens down in Honduras because I went down last time with no other teammates. But there are like-minded people from around the country who want to pay it forward, who want to give back. And you can go down and a full brigade, it could be as many as 50 people who you've never met before. And you get down there on a Saturday and you meet each other and you watch the children go to mass on Saturday evening and you have your pre-team meetings on Sunday. And by Monday morning, these 50 people who you may have never met now become a well-oiled team. And Paul, you know why they're a well-oiled team? Because they've all got that same common goal of helping people. And it unites them. And it's amazing how quickly this team gels with people that you may have never met before. That's wonderful. So so I would imagine when you're doing your 17 or 20 cases during the week, do you try and get the same people working with you so that you can maximize the number of patients you can see during that time period or, or perform surgery on? Does that help you if you're able to do that? It, it helps us, but there's an awful lot of talented people down there. And it is interesting that when you have a team who are down there to help others, that even if that's not their main focus at home, they find a way to get it done. And that sense of team, that sense of congeniality, that sense of purpose gels even those teammates that may not have that same focus when they're at home. Mm, that's great. So how has serving in this capacity affected you personally? What do you get out of doing this? Why did you get started in it? You know, I think that it was something that I always wanted to do. I had to wait till my kids were a little bit older so that you could go and, and do these kind of missions I, I've got to tell you, I've been in practice for over 30 years, but, I, but I'm just ramping up. Just want to let you know that. 
Uh, <laughs> and, and I've got to tell you now that the work that I do with One World Surgery is the best thing that I do. It allows me to, to pay it forward. It has a tremendous sense of satisfaction. And, and I'll tell you a story that when we do these medical missions, they have now some reasonable headquarters for to stay in. We used to stay in these little brick huts with mosquito netting, no hot water, and questionable plumbing. And SCA, who is one of the partners of One World Surgery, has built a, a place for us to stay that's much nicer now. But you still walk down a dirt path with shorts, a t-shirt, a backpack, and you're doing so as the sun is coming up. Now, this ranch where the kids are has its own cows, its own crops. They grow their own food there. And you're walking up as the sun is coming up over the Honduran mountains. And it truly is spiritual. And I'm not particularly overly a religious person, but this is spiritual. And you're going to go and you're going to work for 12 hours and you're going to help so many people, and they're saying, God bless you, God bless you, please may I take a picture with you, because they're so, so grateful. And you go back, and as a team, you have some dinner at night, and drink some Salve Vida, which is the Honduran beer. Eh, not the best in the world, but it, <laughs> but it, but it tastes pretty good. And, and it is the greatest sense of satisfaction. And Paul, I will tell you, it is probably the truest form of medicine now. There's no insurance. There's no pre-certification. There's no malpractice lawyers. It's all a matter of just helping people. That must be heaven in itself, right? It, it, it is. It is. <laughs> I'm, I, I don't know. I love everything about this. I love the idea of being able to give back, either in service or either you know by donating. Everybody gives back in different ways. But just to hear you talk about it, obviously, this is something that you're passionate about and something that has really had a life-changing effect on you. And it's definitely something, I mean, I, I saw you on LinkedIn and I saw the things that you had done, and which is why I reached out to you because it struck a chord with me because this is something that I would love to be involved with also. So for those of us like me who would really love to be involved, how can nurses or scrubs or other do other surgeons, anyone, be involved in medical missions physically? Or if if that's not something they can do, how can someone donate to assist with the people who can go? One World Surgery has a good presence. Their website is oneworldsurgery.org. And much as you listed those that can be involved, there certainly are physicians, there are nurses, there are scrub techs, there are anesthesia people. But in addition to that, Melanie, there are a lot of general volunteers that go down as well. And there is so much to be done. Some general volunteers may learn to turn over rooms. Some general volunteers may help to organize supplies. But remember, I told you, it also sits on the ranch of a 250 to 300 children's children home. And this is up in the mountains. And I can tell you a story that I went a couple missions ago with a scrub tech who I work with who's terrific. His wife is a physician assistant and who speaks fluent Spanish, which is great. They had a son in high school, didn't really have a medical background. You know what he did all week? Because of the fact that on this ground where there are all these children, there are these rickety sidewalks. And some of these kids are handicapped and in wheelchairs, and they can't get amongst the grounds. He mixed cement and paved sidewalks all week long. So these children with, with handicaps and wheelchairs could get uh, along the grounds. So there are so many opportunities for general volunteers to give back. And that can be your labor. It can be your time. It can be your effort. It can also be donation there as well. But I can tell you, if you're actually down there, it can be a life-changing experience. Oh, I love that. So I guess I'm almost just speechless at this point, <laughs> just because I just, I mean, this is obviously something I'm passionate about as well. But this has been a wonderful conversation. I think it's definitely been brought to light the good that we can do that yes in the operating room it's kind of, we're kind of closed off i guess from the rest of the hospital and we're kind of behind our red line and our closed doors but 
But we really can go out into the world and we can make a difference and we can change the lives of people all over the world. And this is definitely a great way that we could be involved to do that. But thank you for coming and talking to us. I've, I've enjoyed this. Do you have any other final thoughts or any other things you want to say before we finish up? Well, Melanie, one thing I'm going to say is we're going to hold you to it and we're going to get you down there and we'll, we'll do a live uh, podcast from down there as well. But what, hey, that'd be great. But what I've got to say is, listen, you know, we have been blessed with so many things and especially being in this great country that we're in. And our ability to pay it forward is important. What I mean by that is that You can change the life of one person that needs surgery and it can change a whole village. And what I mean by that is if you have someone who just wants to get better so he can support his family or she can support her family, their family, and then they can get back to work because they've been healed by having surgery, then their kids can go to school. And if their kids can go to school, they can get a better education. And so you can do one small act of helping one person and help a whole community. And if you can do that, you can help so many people in such a short amount of time. And I think that that's one of the things that we should be doing on this earth. And and I'm so happy to be able to do so. Thank you for coming and talking to us tonight. Really enjoyed this conversation. Well, Well, thank you, Melody. That was Dr. Michael Redler, orthopedic surgeon with One World Surgery. And Paul, I just enjoyed the conversation. I love hearing about the ways that we can give back, the ways that we can benefit patients who would never have hope otherwise. And I really enjoyed the ways that Dr. Redler told us about how different it was in another country, but how ultimately they're still providing that same safe patient care. I am just so impressed with what they're doing on that ranch in Honduras and the fact that it's not just health care that goes on there, taking care of those kids and everything else. It's, it, it sounds like it's just a wonderful organization. And I really believe that this can change a person's perspective on what they're doing in health care and why they're doing it. It can help them, especially those that are maybe feeling right now a little burned out and, you know, just from all that's been going on with uh, COVID and everything else. And, you know, it kind of can re-energize you in a positive way, I believe. I think you're right, Paul. I mean, when we take the time to help others, we end up filling our cup at the same time. And then we end up finding that renewed energy to go back and care for our patients again. But that is going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to First Case on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or on your favorite podcast application. You can also access bonus content for certain episodes by downloading our smartphone application for iPhone and Android. We would certainly appreciate a rating and review because your feedback is important to the show. On behalf of Paul and myself, thank you for listening to this week's episode of First Case.